Welcome back to Rubrics, our St. Timothy's podcast. Um, after a, a, a week off again, um, as seems to keep happening this time of year, because uh, I got COVID, and so it is <laughs> good to be back. Um, knocked me down for uh, a few days, but um, oh, more than a few days. Well, knocked you down for I a whole was, week, was, just about. I was, yeah. yeah, I was sick, and then I thought I was better, and then it really hit the second time with with fever and guns blazing. How many COVID? Um, how many COVIDs have you had? Two? There's two. Yeah, Chloe got it for the first time this time um, after years and years. But I got it some, somewhere around <coughs> Christmas one year. Um, and then this time. And this time was a million times worse. Uh, well, I'm, it was rough. I, am, I sound awful. I don't have COVID. I, I took two days off after um, a marathon, two to three weeks of being here every day. And it was so beautiful yesterday in the it 70 nice. that yeah. I, I just walked all morning. I walked to vote. I walked um, around uh, my neighborhood area. And then I had a campfire last night. So between the pollen and the smoke, mm-hmm. it's um, I am, I'm full on Claritin and Claritin D, whatever else. So not COVID, but certainly allergies are in. But spring is coming. Mm-hmm. Daylight saving yeah, is Sunday, Sunday, so I will be in a uh, discernibly better you'll mood. You'll be the only one in a better mood. I'll be in a better mood. Everyone's going to be mad because they lose no. sleep, and you'll be bouncing around. So, no. Give us the prayer, Father. Let us pray. Almighty God, who see us that we have no power of ourselves to help ourselves, keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Almighty and everlasting God, who hatest nothing that thou hast made, and dost forgive the sins of all those who are penitent, create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of thee the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So this past Sunday, uh, I had a almost a whole sermon prepared, and then you know tapped out at the le- at the end because um, I wasn't sure if I was even going to be here. But um, the first lesson was on the Ten Commandments, and you talked a little bit about this in your sermon. Um, and I've got some things to to mention, but let's start with um, maybe. You know, give a, a thirty-second summary of what you preached on, um, especially, you know, kind of how the Ten Commandments maybe get misused sometimes as as uh, trying to be something more than they are or something that they're not. Um, but maybe give a thirty-second, you know, quick spiel for for people who either forgot your sermon or or weren't here to hear it um, about why the Ten Commandments. Who would forget are, my sermon? Uh, that's right. Yeah. Well, well, I can't do I can't it. do a thirty second anything, so I'm not gonna I'm not even gonna um, maybe promise to do that. Well, I'll I'll just talk until I'm done. <laughs> uh, the with the comment I made that you're alluding to, I think is, and I think tech well, Alabama in the early two thousands mm-hmm. was was a battleground for this. I'm I think certain Tennessee Texas did? Texas did it. Yeah. So there's always there's I know in the past there's always been a, a movement to to post the Ten mm-hmm. Commandments in various places. Mm-hmm. Courthouses, schools is a big one. Often, I mean, you'll see sometimes yard signs or, or real yep. estate signs with the Ten Commandments, which, listen, let me be fit clear, there's nothing wrong with the yeah. Ten Commandments. We like the Ten Commandments. Well, we like the yeah. Ten Commandments. But the Ten Commandments, I think, um, maybe not even intentionally, have become a symbol for mm-hmm. a different kind of culture war yeah. that... The the thought is if we can just there's this thought often that if we can just bring religion and prayer back in schools yeah, then everything will be fixed. everything will be fine and I don't really know how much religion and well I have two thoughts on that how much religion and prayer were ever in school mm-hmm. other than maybe a prayer after the pledge of allegiance right. or right. or maybe some um, general kind of Bible story class yeah I, I give you that a long time ago what I've always told people that bring that to me is, you know, what's, what, what is someone's qualifications in teaching the faith? And do I want that? I mean, what, how are they going to teach the Bible? Mm -hmm. What is the curriculum? I mean, it's not as if to not 
be taught the Bible or to be taught the Bible wrongly? Or, or not to be taught the Bible in school and you get your yeah, biblical correct. education in church. Yeah. Other than, and what would then what I'm afraid would happen is it would be the opposite. Mm-hmm. You would go to school to get your Bible teaching and then say, well, I don't need to go to church because mm-hmm. I got it. I got it in school. So, I mean, there's that thought that if we can just restore them and harken back to a more idyllic uh, Elysium time, things would be better. But but that's not that's not going to happen. And the comment I made, and the reason why that's not going to happen magically is that you can really follow, I think, all those commandments. You can fulfill the letter and not really have any engagement with the divine or faith or think about mm-hmm. God. A comment I made is fidelity in marriage, not stealing, um, not committing murder. None of those are necessarily a requirement of religion. Mm-hmm. You can be completely secular and and fulfill all those things. So it's not the magic bullet that if we just post it on, on the wall or outside a courtroom, all of a sudden law, love of God and love of neighbor mm-hmm. would be automatic. So the Ten Commandments aren't that sign of a, of a. Um, we okay? We're good. We're having things pop up on the yeah. screen here. It's always, um, it's always stressful. So, then, but they're deeper than that. I mean, they're 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 they are the sign of God's covenant, and adherence to that law is the people of God's affirmation or willingness to be a part of that covenant. It's the outward right. sign that I am a part of of God's covenant people. And the 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 take the the take that I had, sorry, the, the Claritin's really kicking in now. The, the the take that I had was, and I find this very interesting because the gospel was the cleansing of the temple. Mm-hmm. And in Exodus twenty, where the RSV English translation had, I think it was three hundred and ninety four words. Yeah. Two hundred of those or one ninety eight were of the second and fourth commandment, mm-hmm. meaning that the commentary was really on those those commandments that dealt specifically with worship, no mm-hmm. graven images, and you shall not bow down and worship them, and then um, the sanctification Sabbath. of the yeah. Sabbath. And then I think that's very interesting to, to juxtapose that with Jesus' dramatic display of anger and cleansing the temple over worship. And worship is such a primary um, event and it's not it's not just simply where we are educated about things of God. Yeah. It's where we come in contact with the divine and receive our orientation, and our posture and attitude and motivation in worship is of utmost importance. And it was a throwaway s- statement that I made Sunday, but we need to not forget that the first murder mm-hmm. in the biblical story was over worship, and was over yep. one's motivation in worship. And and it's it's a it is literally a matter of life yeah. and death. So that was that was the the what I wanted to happen was people to think about the Ten Commandments yeah. differently and not to simply say, well, I don't do any of these things I'm not supposed to do. So therefore, there is no necessary engagement for me. Yeah. I don't worship idols. I have only one God. I don't say GD, which is not which is not the fulfillment of. I mean, that's not the all that commandment yeah. is. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that commandment. About. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, you know. I'm nice to mom and dad, whatever. And then you forget about them because you've Correct. already fulfilled them. Yeah. Well, that's we, we've already missed the point if we if we think that's the case. Yeah. Going back to what you said about you know putting in the core houses and thinking everything's going to be fixed. I I think uh, the reason people make that conclusion or make that jump is is because people equate being religious with being a nice person. Um, you know, and, and that's that's kind of as far as it goes. I think deep down, um, people want their kid to be a good person, a nice person. And what they mean by that is follow the Ten Commandments, don't do anything crazy. But in the interior spiritual life, eh, I think some people are a little bit more indifferent on that. Whether or not they, you know, go to Mass every Sunday or, or a couple times a week, as long as they're a good person. I think I think people if they're honest with themselves, um, are probably more in that position. And so they think, put the Ten Commandments up, teach us how to be a, a good person. And they may have been taught it. that, you know? Right. I mean, to their, in their defense, that they may not have been Correct. In, in I mean, challenged that's, otherwise. That's how Sunday school has gone for a long, long, long time. It's just teaching kids how to be good kids. Yeah. Uh, respect mom and dad, don't tell a lie, good, you got your religious education. But it, but it has to go deeper than that. So um, 
I'm going I'm to kind of go through the Ten Commandments, and I have a, a couple of things to say about a, a couple of them. Um, but the first thing I want to point out is right off the bat, um, <coughs> and I don't remember when, wh- where did Sunday's reading pick up? Was it verse 1? Did we, did we begin with the beginning of chapter 20? Oh, I don't remember. Because today at Mass, we, we read Hang on, tell you part of me. Exodus 20, but it picked up at honor thy father and thy mother, and so I'm, I'm getting the two confused, but... As you look that up, um, chapter 20, kind yeah, of this... Yeah, one, one okay, so begin with Okay, so what I find interesting is how this begins. So uh, in the Old Testament, um, as I was preparing for my own sermon, I, I came across um, people talking about there's two kinds of laws. One is, um, I think they call them like, I forget what they call them, but it's an if-then law. <coughs> if you do this you know, then this will happen. If X, then Y. Um, And some of those laws are basically, don't do this or else here is the punishment. We get those in Leviticus a lot. Then there's another kind of law that's basically, there's there's no if then. It's just, thou shalt not. Don't do this. Um, And the reason given for that is not because of a specific punishment you want to avoid, but just generally speaking, this is what is true. This is what is false. Don't do what's false. And that is kind of what... The Ten Commandments are. Um, we do get, you know, if you do these, then I will be your God, and we get that covenant language, but um, the reason for the Ten Commandments is in the beginning of chapter 20 when God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and then you shall have no other gods before me. I mean, right off the bat, the reason is, um, the reason we should follow the, the Ten Commandments is because God is God. I mean, that's kind of what he's saying. Um, I'm the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And then he goes right into all of the the laws. And then, um, you know, so this is a a rule or a commandment that's not necessarily if you break this, then this will happen. It's it's almost more foundational than that. It's this is what is coming from the God who led you out of Egypt. And so the, the natural response when the Israelites remember that would be to follow these commandments. So I think that's kind of interesting, um, the, the preface to the, all the Ten Commandments. And then also, um, you know, just historically speaking, um, the Ten Commandments were not always, uh, you know, to, to make a pun out of it, set in stone. Um, there was a lot of debate on how to number them and um, where to group them together. And so we kind of, you know... You did a whole little spiel in the sermon about helping helping people to remember them. Um, but, you know, which one is six or seven or whether the Roman Catholic Church has two different ones at the end or one different one, it doesn't really matter. No. Um, don't get hung up on those. But um, the first four are our relationship with God. And you already said, you know, the, the um, Sabbath and making um, an idol – are, uh, you know, the two ones that do with worship get the most screen time, basically. Um, well, not only that, but it's, um, we now have our Bibles open. So we had verses 1 through 17. Mm-hmm. Um, you get and, even more at the end. Yes, and then, but then, so you have kind of, whenever you have, whenever you're reading your Bible and you have what is sort of a, a natural break or mm-hmm. an episode it's it's in greek called a pericope yeah so the next pericope really or the next transition in verse 22 is now the law concerning the altar yeah. which again yep. it goes back to the the point i was making is is that worship is our our modern 2024 western understanding of worship is disproportionate to to the emphasis it's given yeah. in in the Bible and in the early church, mm-hmm. meaning that we diminish its role. Correct, um, and, and it was it was in a way that would have been unfathomable um, when when this was revealed. And and when you look at just one thing to make is the Ten Commandments were given as a connection of the revelation of God. Yeah. This is this this is this is comes with it. And verse two says, "I am the Lord your God." Who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery? Then here's the commandment number one: You shall have no other gods before me. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's it's all about the revelation of God. So what these commandments do by our adherence to them, our submission to them, we are now joining ourselves with with the people that God has chosen to make a covenant with, yeah. and in that covenant, God is revealed. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, Moses is. I mean, this is. Um 
We don't become good people. God is revealed. Correct. Yeah, and this is an image. I mean, the the setting kind of makes that point. This is uh, almost a return to the Garden of Eden, is what a lot of the commentators say. That you know Moses ascends literally into heaven, into paradise, and when he encounters God, what does he return with? He returns with this summary of um, <coughs> what it means to be in right relationship with God and each other. And so, I mean, you see the people. Um, and this is what we read at Mass today, uh, right after the, the Ten Commandments, and then we, we get this, you know, almost addition, uh, the sound of the trumpet, the mountain smoking, the people are terrified, and yep. they basically say, don't let God talk to us, or we're going to die of fear. So Moses, you go be our mediator, and you go up there into the clouds and thick darkness. And then Moses is, you know, the one who gets to encounter that, and that's where we get his face shining. Um, and that's when I said, that I said this at 11 o'clock, I didn't say it at 9, I mean, depending on which service yeah. you come to, you get a different version of the homily, is that worship should be familiar, Yeah. but it should always be a little uncomfortable, it should, or maybe yeah. a lot uncomfortable, yeah. in the sense that you are approaching the holiness of God, and and. I get that fear, I, I equate biblical fear, theological fear, with lack of presumption. Yeah. And we do not presume yeah. to come to yeah, this, yeah. you know, table of merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness. That's the the summary, I think, of fear. Yeah, that's uh, good. Fear and trembling of doing that is not to be so comfortable that I I don't I take for granted yeah. what where we are, what we're doing in the presence that we're now in and what that As demands. As if I've of earned us. it or Correct. I'm owed it. Or yes, that that I that I'm I'm owed it. So uh, the third commandment. Um, let's see, where 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 are we at? First one, you shall know the gods Verse before seven. me. Two, oh yeah, so third. Um, interesting. I, I don't know if I've ever read the NRSV translation of this. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. Um, do you have NRSV also? Unfortunately, I do. Oh, well. Uh, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain is kind of how you normally hear this. And this one is really interesting. Um, I want to not uh, correct the idea that, you know, oh, it's just not saying GD. Don't, don't, say, don't that. say that. Don't yeah. say that. But what this what this commandment actually is saying, um, here's, a, here's a very easy way to remember this. You shall not take or make wrongful use, as the NRSV says, uh, if you were to try to write the Hebrew in English, um, transliterator, or whatever they call it, it would be N-A-S-A, um, NASA. And if you remember, what does NASA do? It lifts things up into space. That is what that Hebrew word means. You shall not carry up or lift up or um, take up with you the name of the Lord your God in vain. And this is the, the most interesting way I heard this commandment explained, and it really made it come alive for me. Um, they, they don't... This commandment will not have its deepest meaning until later when they have the tabernacle and temple. And when the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies, they literally put the name of the Lord their God on them and so that they carry the name of God with them on behalf of the people. And so what this is really getting at is if you're going to call yourself the people of God, especially the priests, if you're going to carry the name of God with you on behalf of the people, don't do it in vain, meaning... Take it seriously. Don't presume to carry God's name with you as if it's a little token and as if you're just like all the other nations. It, it's, it's a way to set them apart. Um, so I think that helps uh, broaden that commandment a little bit. It's not just saying, don't say that word, because if your tongue makes you know that word come out, boo, bad. But as long as you don't say that, you can, you can curse and, you know, curse people, curse God, all you want, as long as you don't say that specific word. That's not what it's meaning. Yeah. Um, it's saying don't carry the name of the Lord your God. Don't don't be a Christian. Um, don't be God's people in vain. Uh, act like it. Let me see if I can perhaps, in my medicine-induced stupor here, come up with a more recent example that might get into this. And I'm going to be, um, this may not work, but the Oscars are coming up soon. Yeah. And do you remember, was it last no, two, two Oscars ago? You're talking about Will Smith? Will Smith. Was that last <laughs> I think year? It was two years ago. Two years ago? Whenever it I was. What did Will Smith? So everyone knows this. Uh, Chris Rock was the host. Yeah. And he was, he was making fun of Will Smith's wife's uh, alopecia. Mm -hmm. And Will Smith 
did not take kindly to that. Yeah. Do you remember what he said Didn't from he his say, seat? Take her name out of your mouth. Do or? not, do not wait, wait, take take my wife's, take name, my wife's name, out name out of, of your, your mouth, mouth yeah. right? And I think what's interesting about that is in, what he did was a thousand percent inappropriate, yeah, wrong, correct. and probably should have gone to jail. Let's yeah. just say that. But I think what's interesting is is that the sentiment he's getting at is that knowing someone's name um, denotes. A relationship mm-hmm. of intimacy, mm-hmm. and we no longer live by that by that yeah. social code. I saw I saw on Twitter this morning of a, a, um, a UK friend named Father James Mather. He was talking about how his first two years when he was a brand new priest in in the UK, they're called um, they they do they serve under a training incumbent, like the, the priest is going to teach them how to do stuff. And he said that the custom was only father plus surname. So Father mm-hmm. Klingstead, mm-hmm. Father Rice. He said two years into that, they were at a diocesan meeting, and and, and um, another priest asked the training incumbent, what's your, what's your curate's name? He says, you know, Father Klingstead. And he said, what's his Christian name? He said, I, um, Stephen, I think. <laughs> and it wasn't. Yeah. He had no idea. But the idea that, that we have... An appropriate boundary, which would be surname, mm-hmm. you know, a prefix surname, Mr., Ms., Father, Doctor, whatever it is. But to know someone's given name, Christian name, denotes a level of intimacy. Right. Only sort of friends mm-hmm. can do that. Um, even we do that with pet names. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so that was that was the controversy with with Queen Elizabeth II and and the Duke and Duchess of Sussex by naming their daughter Lilibet, mm-hmm. which was the pet name for the Queen. That that's a kind of a an intimacy mm-hmm. that you have. So the idea that that's kind of lost on us in our modern time where we're so informal, right. but yet a lot of our issues we're dealing with are the disintegration of boundaries. Yeah. But if you're given God's name, to call on God, to have access to God. To not presume yeah. with that. And also that when you call upon God, God responds. Yep. And if you're calling on God to do something that's flippant or in vain, that shows your... Rel- that's the it's not that God is offended. Mm-hmm. It's that we now show our lack of respect ourselves. Yeah, that's good. And, and, and that is the problem. And it's easy to do. It's easy to do because now... Now saying God or Lord or even Jesus is, is just now... Um, a gentle expletive, you yep. know. I'll, I'll, yep. It's a cultural. I'll, I'll with with my children. You know, they'll be playing the video games. Oh God, or oh good Lord. I said, I'm sorry. Are we praying? Yeah. It's an evening prayer. I thought yeah. we've already had that. What are we doing? Just a way to say, I know you're not thinking. I know you're not trying yeah. to be right. blasphemous or irreverent. Um, but pay attention what comes out of your mouth, mm-hmm. because that's that's what Jesus says. It's not what goes yeah. in. It's what comes out. Yeah. And if we have that level of of presumption that I can call upon this, Mm -hmm. then that's going to um, lead to sort of bigger, more important spiritual problems. And some people will say, well, that wasn't my intention. That's not what I meant by it, which is uh, true. But I I think the the danger of that comes then when you try to pray, that word has lost its uh, reference associated with it. You'll find it harder to pray because... The name you're calling on is the name you, you know, say when someone cuts you off in traffic. So, no, you may not mean it as uh, flippant or irreverent, but it will actually affect the times you're trying to be reverent or respectful. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good way of, I think, understanding that. Don't, don't carry the name of God. Don't call on the name of God in a flippant or irreverent way. Um, the, the, the flip side of that is God's name is powerful. And he, he, he promises to be with you. Um, the Israelites know that God is Yahweh. Um, they know his name. And so, you know, there's a, there is an intimacy there, a blessing there, and, and don't take it for granted. I would make the connection of the, so the, the divine name mm-hmm. given to the high priest to go in the Holy of Holies yeah. to wear, I think, on their breastplate or the yeah, turban one, the breastplate. I'm trying to remember what it was. And... There's a we don't have time today to go into the real interesting thought behind all that, but the idea that the idea that the high priest goes into sort of the uncreated realm, the holy yeah, of holies, yeah. what gives what gives them access to do that is the divine name, mm-hmm. and then when they come out through the temple veil, they still bear the divine name and they they bring the divine with them. Mm-hmm. I think what's interesting is is that. I said earlier, what is your Christian name? Yeah. What is your name given at baptism? Is that we are named 
and 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 the idea of a Christian name would be to take a saint's name. But we are signed with the name of Jesus. Mm-hmm. You are marked as Christ's own forever. So now it's no longer the high priest that bears the name of God. Mm-hmm. That name is given to us. Yeah. And even and we've talked about this before. Even how there's a real strong. Um, act of piety in this parish that we do in a more dramatic fashion because we're wearing berettas whenever the holy name of Jesus is said. We've talked about this before. We remove our beretta and bow our head. That Doing that, and even when I hear the name of Jesus outside of a a liturgy, my, my my head bows automatically. It's Pavlovian. That is a, a powerful reminder mm-hmm. to me not to say that flippantly, mm-hmm. or unless I am desiring to invoke the divine. It's again, it's not as if lightning bolts are going to come through the cloud right. because God is not God, mad at you. God is not Beetlejuice. Yeah. If we say His name three times, He appears. It's not a game. It's not magic, mm-hmm. but it, it forms us into our relationship with God. Yeah, yeah. The Ten Commandments are, are humans. They're they're not they're not for God. Um, so then you, then you get the Sabbath day, and you get a lot of explanation about that. Again, what I think is interesting um, with like this commandment and, and a lot of the worship commandments is they don't have the tabernacle or temple yet. They don't really fully understand what these mean yet. They, it's something that they will live into. Um, they get the law for how to do all of the temple worship before they actually have the temple. And so this there is an element of... Um, here is where I'm leading you. Is kind of what God is saying to the people. I don't want to get too specific because this would be another another topic. But if you're looking like at chapter 19 of Exodus, if you're curious, and then you see that the priests are involved, yeah. Yet the priesthood wasn't given, it's not yet. given yet. And the, the, the sort of the the biblical studies part is that during exile, when they had to codify these laws mm-hmm. and things, they, they were writing it from a perspective of the temple being Correct. built, yeah. but, they're, but they're, they're recreating the experience in the wilderness yeah, where there was the movable... And, yeah, yeah. Um, but there is some really interesting um, commentaries kind of looking at this and saying, um, what do we do with um, maybe two events that seem connected, but apparently occur in different times, and, and what does that mean for incarnation? There's really interesting stuff, but yeah, don't get don't get stressed out. Um, maybe uh, if you come across that and say, "Wait a minute, there's yeah. there's no temple yet." Um, the second, you know, half, second five through ten are all about our relationship with each other. Um, you know, I don't have a ton to say about most of these. The, the one I was going to preach on, um, if I was feeling up to it, was don't covet. And the reason I was going to preach on it is because it seems almost out of place. Um, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal. These are all, you know, actions which would destabilize a society. Um, they're taken seriously. Um, you know, you don't want people going around murdering each other or lying. Then you don't know who to trust. Kind of destabilize the society. Don't covet. It doesn't at first seem that bad. I mean, it's it's don't desire, you know, inordinately material possessions and, in you know, I think our gut reaction is to say, well, that doesn't seem as bad as you know, stealing and murdering or um, you know, not honoring your father or mother or committing adultery. But, but covet leads to the rest. It does. Is that what you're going to get yeah, at? Yeah. yeah, that's what I was going to get at. And I was going to say, if you really boil it down, I mean, don't covet is, is in a sense telling God uh, it's not fair. You're not meeting my expectations or um, I have a certain set of desires and reality needs to conform to that. And, and the Christian response is... To actually do the opposite. My desires need to be conformed to Jesus Christ. It's my desires that need to be changed. Reality doesn't have to be changed to fit what I want. And if you if you allow covetousness to kind of brew, it is serious. And it would destabilize your relationship with each other, with God. It puts you in competition with one another. Um, so I, I think it's interesting to, to kind of meditate on that a little bit and to say, um, don't covet at first glance seems... Not as bad as some of the others, but it actually, I think, is the foundation of a lot of the others. Does it not go back to Genesis 3? Mm -hmm. You saw the fruit was good. Yeah, Yeah. pleasing for the eye. Pleasing to the eye. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, don't covet um, is kind of how it ends. You know, don't covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Um, And then Exodus 20 continues, and we get all sorts of other laws that kind of flow from these. Um, Yeah, the Ten Commandments are said a lot during um, 
some parishes will, will read them during Lent. Decalogue, yeah. Yeah, the, the Decalogue. Um, we do the summary of the law at daily Mass and at our 1928 um, each week. But, um, you know, Jesus summarizes all of these with love God and love your neighbor. Um, on these two commandments hang all the law of the prophets. And you kind of see those in here anyway. Right relationship with God, right relationship yeah. with each other. Yeah, I kind of, our, our summary of the topic is, just in case anyone misunderstands the beginning, is that we actually think we should take them very seriously. Yeah, correct. More seriously than just making them a symbol or an image to some other proxy culture war. Yeah. Because they are, I mean, <laughs> there's more to them than, than just simply listing 10 moral precepts that right. we should follow. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of depth there. Any final comments on the Ten Commandments or, um, you know... No, other than repeating what is said in the liturgy when you read the Decalogue, incline our hearts to keep this thy law. Yeah, it's a that's good. It's a beautiful phrase. It is. Well, a bit of a shorter episode. We're, what, halfway through Lent? Um, and no podcast next week, so those who are listening. Yeah, no podcast next week, so the next time we, we get together, it, Holy Week will be upon us. Um, yeah. and so it's, it's coming quick. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen.